Hello, this is Jason Kendall. Welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. This time we're going to be talking about the Milky Way's spiral arms and how they formed and what they look like. So the most important thing that we have in this section for this time is understanding how we know where they come from and actually how we can measure them because we see in the past from the previous things that people have thought that the Milky Way was just like the other spiral arms, except we're inside other spiral nebulae or other spiral galaxies, except we're inside it, so we can't see the arms with any great ease. And since the size scale of the Milky Way is so that you have to get over 3,000 light years just to get above the Milky Way, nobody's ever going to do that ever. I mean, ever which means that you know people don't get these things done and you know humans are not going to travel thousands of light years as an individual and then see them no star wars movie is just not going to happen in any event so what we want to do is instead find a way to measure the position and uh, motion of gas clouds because they trace the size of the milky way spiral form all right, so again, we know that there must be massive gas clouds and massive dust clouds. We do know that because we, we see it in the sky. So not just plastered on the side of the sky, we want to see if this cloud is in front of that cloud and in which direction are they, and then hopefully be able to map that. So that's our goal. So what are spiral arms? And spiral arms are these spiral-shaped patterns that are dotted with hot stars, type O and B type stars, young star clusters and gas and dust. The O and B type stars form in these regions, in the spiral arms, and light them up. And we know that the O and B type stars are very, very, very uh, short-lived, so the pattern of the spiral structure should change because, well, they're illuminated by the O and B type stars, so therefore that must that pattern must change and we see that we see giant molecular clouds can be seen in radio light and the hydrogen gas and dust clouds can be seen in the infrared but these objects are hardly ever found outside the spiral arms meaning above and below or, or specifically between those things so the gas clouds must be there but they get bunched up so what is all about the bunching so what are spiral arms well they can't be rotating along with the galaxy or along with the stars. Because if the, if the spiral arms themselves were fixed objects and rotated, and the stars played a part in rotating them, then they would stay illuminated, and as such, the things that are illuminated are the stars, and then we would perceive them as spiraling up. So we never see anything like the latter one. There's almost nothing like that in the sky. There are things like the first one in there and the things like the middle one, but nothing like the last one. So therefore, spiral arms don't just kind of are formed and are stretched like spaghetti or something like that. That must not be how they work. But we do know that spiral arms are the sites of where massive star formation is occurring. And the sun takes about a quarter, almost over 200 million years, about 260 million years to take an orbit. And so therefore, it's, it'll do a grand total of 50 orbits around the galaxy before it, become, before it dies and becomes white dwarf. Now, O and B type stars only about, live about a million years. So a million to 10 million years. So let's call it a million or 10 million just for fun. And that means they move at most one hour on the galactic clock. So you can look at the galaxy as a disk. And we can, we can think that if you move 200 million years or 240 million years in the course of going around once at the radius of the sun, then if that's the case, and let's say an object lives only, say, oh, 2 million years, then that is 1 twelfth of the orbit. So that's about 1 hour. So we can think of the, the star moving very, very, very short distance on the clock face of the spiral galaxy very close before they die. So basically where you see an O star is where it was born, is where it's lived, and where it's going to die. And that's pretty much what we think. That what we, that's what we know. So we see the O and B type stars and the H2 regions, which they light up, and they're in the spiral arms, and that's what Walter Botta said, were the beads on a string. So galactic spiral arms, then, are probably not fixed objects, but rather density waves, or waves of, or, or places where there is more stuff. That's a better way of thinking. Waves of stuff where, where things enter into this traffic jam and then leave. 
And we can see that from this little diagram that there seems to be a flow because yes, if you do Doppler, if you do some Doppler checks and do see the rotation, you do see that the galaxies are rotating. But what exact pieces are rotating? They're not fixed objects, so a galaxy does not rotate as a disk. It is a swirling mass of stars and particles. So what is happening? We can think of the, notice that the, the diagram that we see on the left is kind of a quintessential diagram. We've got this dark dust cloud, and in front of the dust cloud, in terms of the rotation, are a bunch of hot ONB type stars. So we can either think of that as being in front of the dust cloud, or more specifically, that that's where a lot of stuff is. The, the spiral arm is where an excess of stuff is, so gas clouds enter the place where there's lots of stuff, get compressed, and then form stars, and then the stars move, into, from, uh, move along from their inherent motion around the galaxy. So it's basically gas goes into the thing and stars come out. That's another way of thinking about it. So Spiral arms themselves, if we think of them as density waves, then they can look very similar to this. So everything's got an orbit. At the sun's got an orbit. The, the uh, Orion Nebula's got an orbit. Uh, Betelgeuse has got an orbit. Every star in the sky has an orbit around the Milky Way. And because the orbits, every single orbit is an ellipse, that's Kepler's laws, we can then say we can nest the ellipses. So let's say we nest a whole bunch of elliptical orbits and they're offset. Maybe they're rotated a bit and offset by a bit. You'll see that in this nested, rotated version of it all, we find that there's some darker areas where the lines line up. And they tend to be, uh, and, and when they line up, that's where many orbits cross. And so if there happens to be a star or a gas cloud, specifically say, let's say, a long trail of gas cloud that, that goes in the entire orbit, so a stream of gas clouds, then as those streams of gas clouds, let's, let's pretend that all of these nested orbits are streams of gas clouds, then they get to a place where they can press together. And so when they press together, there's more gas. If there's more gas, then they can form the stars. So the compression area for the streams of gas is where stuff occurs. All right, so that's what we mean by the nested orbit. And in fact, if you look closely, we can see a spirally sort of pattern. And so if it's where if if the action is where they get bunched up then the orbits still are contained with a lot of gas all these dark lines are where the orbit of the streams of gas are it's just where all the orbits bunch up is where all the activity is occurring and that's this idea of the of a density wave so we can also think of it this way this is kind of a little bit of an odd way of thinking about it the there's a there's a kind of a place where things have to compress and get together and that's just where they're happening and as they compress together they have to slow down and when they do slow down there's interactions or we can say that actually they stay the same speed <laughs> another way to think about it is they're staying all the same speed they just kind of pass through all right so these nested elliptical orbits create the stellar traffic jams. Those stellar traffic jams are where the gas clouds are compressed, and that is about the same. That's exactly how I think. But now if you take this entire system and then rotate it, the entire system then also rotates as a group, and that's because well, the, it's in, the elliptical orbits aren't fixed, so the entire system rotates, and then you have a rotating spiral galaxy. All right, so again, gas and dust clouds move into those places where they where the density is higher and because the gas moves into that place where the density is higher where there's other gas moving in then they compress that forms O and B type type stars and and there's remnants of that gas then they're illuminated by the hot O and B type stars as they pass through star formation occurs vigorously, dust is formed, gas is formed, and you get things like you look off to the right. Now what exactly kicks it off is not well known. How do you actually start this process? Eh, it's an area of active research. But we can see that this explanation has a really good, um, has a really good uh, explanation in the terms of the picture to the right, where we see the gas clouds, which are dark gas clouds, which is an overdensity in general, and those are places where the gas is bunching up and potentially beginning the process of star formation. Then 
the gat, that's where we have like the string. So the dark lines are like a string, and the star formations areas are like the beads on a string, such as Walter Botta described. So looking closer at this diagram, we see that the red arrows indicate the gas entering into one of those uh, into those dense areas. That's where it gets. That's where the gases compress together, stars form inside of that, the gas and dust compresses together, forms those stars, and out the other side because it doesn't stop flowing just because it gets dense. You get uh, O and B type star associations where there are groups of stars where there's no gas around them anymore, but they're just associated and eventually they explode. But if the, and they've used up all their gas. But then you have H2 regions, or ionized hydrogen regions, around O and B type stars if the gas wasn't completely used up in the process. So you get an O and B association if the gas is used up, and the H2 if it's not, and some of the remnant gas somehow made it through. So that's how, that's another way of looking at it. And here's a really fantastic example of exactly what I'm talking about, what Walter Botta would do, and this is a Hubble Heritage visual uh, uh, view of the Whirlpool Galaxy M51. So let's see what we mean by the, the order of things. So we have a general rotation that would be, according to this image, counterclockwise. However, as the gas comes in, it will encounter the density, the dense area of that, the nested elliptical orbits of the streams of gas. And you can almost see how the gas kind of looks nested, and like there's these streams that come into and out of. But yet there's an overall dominant feature that is the dark, dark, dark areas, which are the string-like things, which have the beads along them. So two big arms or what we're talking about here and the gas flows into those dark areas which is where it's dense and out the other side flows stars that are brighter so this is what we mean we see a dark lane where stars are where the gas is bunched up and ahead of that dark lane in the after the process has happened we get the gas compressed and it becomes these hot stars and the pink glow is the pink glow of hydrogen and notice the pink glow of hydrogen and the bright stars are on one side of the spiral arms. That's because the flow goes into the density wave and through the density wave and out the density wave. And notice you don't have too many bright hot stars far from the density wave because the O and B type stars pretty much detonate before they get a chance to get very far because they live a very short period of time. So this tells us a lot about the evolution of the stars and now we're going to then say, well, fine, do we see evidence for that? That's M51, an external galaxy. Do we see it here? And this is an image provided by the Spitzer Space Telescope of, an, of, of a very familiar area of the sky, actually. And this is, in the, this is close to the constellation Sagittarius. And M17 is one of the great nebulae, uh, emission nebulae in the sky. But now we're looking at, oh, at, at uh, infrared light. And we're actually looking down a cross section of a spiral arm. So this is like taking one of the spiral arms, cutting it lengthwise, and looking down it. So we'll start off that the flow direction goes left, goes right to left in this image, where we have the dark dust clouds that are forming young stars. Then they leave the star forming region and become an H2 region, that, like such as M17. And that's where we have this bright star forming nebula where lots of stars are forming and we got O type stars that are illuminating the nebula and the gas has not been used up completely but it's present in, in copious quantities around even to the left and to the right but the M, but M17 is causing it to glow. And then we go further on and it's older area where there's like a supernova remnant like kind of a bubble shape where something detonated and formed a bubble. So let's look at each of these areas in turn. Here is a dark dust cloud zone where little tiny stars are being formed. And now since we're looking in the infrared, we can see through the dark dusty bands and see the young stars that are forming inside of that. So each of these tiny, tiny, tiny dots, and this is from the Spetzer Space Telescope at Caltech, and they call this the dragon and the swan, which is really very elegant. This kind of looks like a little dragon, so go check out their video. It kind of spins a little bit, so that's what I did is I removed that spinniness, so I didn't like that spin. So anyway, this is their work, and it's an amazing piece of work. Anyways, we see the dark, dusty bands. We see the little tiny baby stars. Those are protostars forming inside of the dark area. 
And then we look to the middle, where we then have a dusty region. Again, there is a lot of dust in this region, and that's what this infrared light is showing. However, it's really hot dust, and this is, a, this is part of this because it's an H2 region, and this is the Omega Nebula because it kind of looks like an upside-down Omega. It's really a tough one to see in this image, but whatever. We see that this dusty region is being caused to glow because of the hot O and B type stars in that area. And then we move over to the left and we see just this kind of faint outline of a bubbly sort of shell. And that is has a certain diameter to it. And you have to really kind of squint and stare to see it. But on average, you could imagine that at least there's a cavity that's been formed. And at least there's a shock front on the left hand side at like nine o'clock, 12 o'clock and seven o'clock that and maybe even there's a kind of a central thing off to the center right where it looks like it's been been cleared away. So a shock wave seems to have formed in this area and that's a natural consequence of a massive explosion of an O-type star and this would be a very 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 old thing and it's sending out it's sending out shock waves into the cosmos. All right. So that would show the eras many eras of star formation by looking down a spiral arm, and this work was a result of uh, Povich at, at Penn State University utilizing uh, NASA JPL's uh, Spitzer Space Telescope with the IRAC MIPS uh, instrument. So fascinating, fascinating study of what it looks like down inside a spiral arm. All right, so what's another way that we can see it? Because this is kind of a tricky thing and infrared light might not be able to give us the map we want. But there is a very good map uh, that we know, which is, comes from the coldest gas. And that cold gas will show us the, the, the source material for stars. So hyd remember, stars make a, are made up of between 75 and eight, uh, 70 and 75 and 80 percent hydrogen. So if we can map that hydrogen, we will map where the stars, where stars will form from. And if there is no hydrogen, then we shouldn't see any emission. Remember, this is the all-sky image of the Milky Way in 21 centimeters, which is radio light, and it's due to hydrogen hydrogen emission. And we see it, it follow, it's right along the band of the Milky Way, right down the galactic disk. We have some high cirrus clouds above and below, but those, but it, it's concentrated almost exclusively along the galactic equator. And it's very, very, very narrow band. So where does this come from? Well, what happens is, is you have an electron and a proton, and if they have an anti, if their spins are aligned, meaning the proton and electron have a quantum mechanical number or a state that we call spin that is very closely related to angular momentum. And in fact, it is the angular momentum of it. But it, they don't spin like little tops, but yet they have angular momentum. It's kind of a weird thing. In any event, um, that's not really what we're talking about, but we'll just pretend for a while that the electron and proton are like little balls and they spin. So if they have spins are, and in fact that's not, not true, but we're just going to pretend for a bit just for the sake of their argument. And if the electron and proton are spinning in the same direction as the electron orbits the proton in the ground state, this is always of course ground state, then it's in a higher energy state and it can randomly just you know, just go, oh, okay, I'm done, and relax and flip randomly. And that will emit light, 21 centimeter wavelength. And it's a very, it's a 1400 megahertz. So this is definitely down in the radio. And it's a long wavelength well, light that needs to be seen with, a prop, with large scale radio telescopes. And this can only happen when the temperature of the gas is very, very cold, between 15 and 100 degrees Kelvin, meaning just above absolute zero, and the density has to be extraordinarily low, with only a hundred to a thousand of these atoms in a cubic centimeter. By comparison, uh, there's like ten to very, uh, <laughs> trillions upon trillions, trillions of trillions of atoms in a cubic centimeter of say salt. So this is these are extraordinarily diffuse clouds, and this is an extremely rare process. So it, hydrogen makes up most of the, of the galaxy, but yet this is a random process that happens amazingly infrequently. So this, is a, this will undercount the total amount of hydrogen that's there. So you have to say, well, what's the probability of it happening, and then multiply it up. All right, so this gives us a path, though, because it radiates at a specific wavelength. So our path is look for redshift changes inside the spiral arms. So if you have a small redshift, that means it is, uh, well, it, well, okay, so we have one arm rotating, and some of the rotation of that arm is away from us. 
So we can think of it as following the blue line, but it's not straight across the blue line. So it's moving both away from us kind of steeply, and uh, it's basically up and to the left, but a nice steep up and to the left. That's arm A. And so that's going to have a big red shift because it's steeply moving away. Now, arm B will have less steep of a red shift, and so it'll be very, very close to whatever the, it'll, it'll have less of a red shift. Arm C, though, is almost, a, almost completely along the line of sight, so we would expect to have almost no red shift associated with it. And likewise, there can be a blue shift, too, if the arm, if it's approaching us. And so we can have, we can use this kind of concept to say, where are the spiral arms? And you can say, well, this cloud has high redshift, this cloud has low redshift, this cloud has lots of redshift. And we can then say, that must be approaching us, away from us, and towards us, and we can map the redshift of it, uh, the Doppler shift of the line from that 20 month centimeter to say, oh, this is, and map it out in redshift space. So what we get is a picture that looks a lot like this. And this is the picture of the Milky Way in 21 centimeter radiation. And we get the distance to these various clouds by, by hook and crook with the brightness. So you have a brightness associated with the clouds and that gives you both the redshift and the 21 centimeter distribution in space. So there is kind of a pancakey sort of structure. And this belies the fact that we don't, we see the, a spirally sort of structure, but mostly we see kind of these ring things. And this is indicative of the fact that these are where the clouds of hydrogen are. And they're not necessarily bound exactly to spiral structure. Remember, they move into and out of spiral structure. So our sun is at the top there, and that kind of wedge at the bottom is because we can't see through the center of the galaxy with 21 centimeter radiation because the center of the galaxy blocks that light. It's so incredibly dense that the 21 centimeter radiation gets absorbed on its way here. So you can see that it was a fascinating little thing that the sun is passing through. That there's like this spur of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a spiral arm that we're kind of passing through. And that gives us all the very, very pretty things that we see in the sky, such as the Orion Nebula and all the other star-forming regions that we get to see. And they're not that distant, so we get to see all sorts of pretty stuff. That's what the result of that little hook that goes around us means. Well, a more recent edition of, of that, of the neutral hydrogen map, comes from Levine et al. and they published this in Science Magazine in 2006. And they had a much, much more uh, robust uh, uh, study of neutral hydrogen and were able to trace out spiral arms. And so their tracing showed that they saw what looks like about three or four spiral arms, depending on how you map it. So we have these spiral arm structures where the, H the neutral hydrogen map more closely approximates the spiral structure once you get a really good map of where things are. And the sun is, of course, uh, in, the, in the center, central region, right at the tip between one, and, between, right at that kind of wedge. And uh, we're not at the center. Uh, the wedge is, the center is the center of the galaxy. All right, so now we have, if we then look out into space and compare this concept, we see that it's very familiar. This is the Triangulum Galaxy, a very, very nearby little galaxy, just about the same distance as Andromeda. And M33 has, like, has neutral hydrogen. And so the neutral hydrogen, uh, if it's brighter, it's more dense. And the molecular clouds are do uh, molecular clouds trace that. And those are where the little, uh, so we see that there's all sorts of our, our, our tracers. So the molecular clouds can be seen to be tracers of things. And they, uh, they indicate, how, much, how many masses of material are in the green dots. So basically, the hydrogen maps out how much hydrogen there is. And so the yellower it is, the more there is. The bluer it is, the less there is. And then there's distinct concentrations in the green dots. So we can then say, wow, this also traces out exactly where carbon monoxide lives. So we can use carbon monoxide as a tracer. We can use H1 radiation as a tracer. And the, uh, the sources are overlaid. So we have two different images uh, with, the, with, the, with their paper image. So that's a really fascinating study to show that molecular clouds are, are, can trace uh, hydrogen. 
And so then if we really look closely at many things and do an extended survey with, the, with say, the VLA and through NRAO, the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, and this was the THINGS survey or the H1 nearby galaxy survey, aren't they great? Aren't they fantastic? So this group led by uh, Walter Brinks Block, by Bijel uh, Thornley and Kennekin, made a survey of nearby galaxies and looked at their H1, or their neutral hydrogen, in 21 centimeters, and we can definitely see the spiral structures. But there's also some mixy sort of things to them, just like we saw with the Milky Way. So therefore, the Milky Way is definitively a spiral galaxy, just like many of the nearby ones. In the upper left is M101, in the, uh, and that is, in a, that's the Whirlpool Galaxy, which is very interesting. Notice that in all of these, the cores, or the very centers, are strongly depleted in neutral hydrogen. Uh, the centers are basically excited by things that are happening down in the core. There are some that are actually kind of messed up too, like you can see like uh, like uh, upper left right below M101 in the upper left. Uh, there's one that kind of looks all squirrely. And basically spiral structure can be demarked by these neutral hydrogen. And so neutral hydrogen demarks the spiral arms as well as carbon monoxide uh, emissions. All right, so a lot of little review questions to go over, especially things like how do we know the Milky Way has spiral arms and so forth. And spiral arms are part of it, and we have ways of measuring the size scale of the Milky Way, what its spiral structure looks like. And in fact, infrared maps show this as well, and to some extent. But it's, uh, but it's the radio maps at 21 centimeter radiation as well as uh, Doppler shifts of carbon monoxide and other molecular tracers that show us the spiral arms. So there's a bit about the Milky Way and its spiral arms. And we'll see you next time.